Well, hello, everyone. This is Al Fadi. Thank you so much for joining us in a special edition of Let Us Reason. With me here is our dear, beloved friend and uh, brother in the Lord, uh, Sam Shamoon. And Sam, thank you, brother, for uh, I know I gave you a short notice today, but uh, hey, I figured we can use the time to uh, bring Hallelujah. glory to uh, the name of our risen Lord. Uh, thank you for everybody, by the way, who's joining us also. Uh, brother, I, I suggested to you today, and, and thankfully you agreed to do this. You know, lately I've heard a lot about, you know, debates between Anthony Rogers, yourself, with uh, Unitarians. And, uh, you know, a lot of people ask questions sometimes, wonder what exactly is the issue here. So I thought maybe today will be a good time for us to just talk about this issue. Why is it a heresy? Uh, what, how does it apply to Islam, for instance, and Islamic thinking, and anything else you want to add, of course, to this? Yes, amen. May the Lord Jesus be glorified, <clears throat> and I invoke the Son of God to bless you and me and fill us with the Spirit. May the Lord Jesus strengthen my voice to keep it healthy for his glory, to use it to glorify him in Jesus' name. As you know, brother, I just <clears throat> came from doing a live stream, and for some reason today, my voice is not at its optimal, but we trust the Holy Spirit to strengthen it for the glory of Christ. <clears throat> now, the topic <clears throat> that you assign, Unitarianism, it's a little tricky, brother, because Unitarianism comes in a variety of flavors <clears throat> and packages. Basically, what does Unitarianism entail? The belief that there's only one person in the Godhead. Now, that belief can take on various manifestations. And again, I'm trusting the spirit to make sure I speak truth without error for the glory of Jesus Christ. Because you and I both know we want to be <clears throat> accurate in describing the beliefs of others. Now, Amen. you have the type of Unitarianism like Islam that says that there's one divine person and he's distinct from Jesus <clears throat> and the Holy Spirit. Now, among even so-called Christians, those who claim to be Christian, and I don't acknowledge them as Christian because they are not Christian. If you deny the Trinity, you're denying the plain teaching of the Bible, which is why many of these folks have to pervert the scriptures, distort the scriptures, misinterpret the scriptures in order to make the scriptures agree that God is not triune. Now, with that said, though, <clears throat> you have so-called Christians that believe only the Father is God, and either Jesus is a human creature, or even the first spirit creature <clears throat> produced by the Father. Job's witnesses, for instance, believe that Jesus Christ is the first spirit creature produced by the Father, and through him <clears throat> created all other things. And the Job of witness understanding, the Holy Spirit is God's active force, Jehovah's active force and his influence upon creation. So that's one form of Unitarianism. Then you have what I refer to, and I didn't come up with this term. Someone else did. One of the heretics from their own camp came up with this term, humanitarian Unitarianism. <clears throat> now, what does that mean? This view teaches that Jesus is a human creature and did not have a prior existence. His life, his existence began at the conception in his blessed mother's womb. Now, they do believe and the virginal conception and birth, because they claim to be biblical Unitarians, that they follow the Bible, they believe the Bible is inspired, inerrant, infallible. So they believe when the Holy Spirit caused Mary to conceive Jesus, that's when Jesus' life began, and he had no prior life in heaven. So they're unlike Joe's witnesses in that sense. And these groups are not monolithic, because when you discuss with them, what they believe about the Holy Spirit, you'll have different opinions. Some will say the Holy Spirit is God's presence, <clears throat> you know, his, his presence in creation or his power. And I've even heard some say that depending on the term, like the Holy Spirit would refer to the fathers himself being present in creation. So it's all over the map. They're not mono, monolithic. Now, if I'm wrong, I'd invite an Unitarian to correct me because again, like I said, <clears throat> they're not monolithic in their views. So you have different Unitarians saying different things about, let's say, the Holy Spirit. So we're learning as we go along. Now, these Unitarians also, some of them call themselves Socinians, which was a heresy in the medieval period that was condemned by Trinitarians. Socinians, right? So that's one form of Unitarianism. Now, you also have another form of Unitarianism that some call oneness or modalist. Oneness theology or modalism. In fact, unfortunately, because he likes to make the rounds and he comments on our YouTube channels, 
the former Muslim who converted to so-called Christianity don't convert to Islam. He is a oneness heretic. He's an anti-Trinitarian. He even called Trinitarians like you and me tritheists. He says we worship three gods and we've rejected the actual monotheism of the Bible. So this is a form of Unitarianism that teaches there's only one person and that's the father. But depending again on which type of oneness or modalist you speak to, either Jesus is the human incarnation of the father because they'll tell you that God became flesh so that Jesus is the human incarnation of the father but he's not a distinct person of the Father in that they don't believe before creation you had a person called the Son that existed with another person called the Father. And for these groups, the Holy Spirit would be God the Father in spiritual activity. So they too are Unitarians in that they believe it's one person. So this one person becomes flesh. That flesh is Jesus Christ, his Son. And then he appears as the Holy Spirit in his spiritual activity. So that too is a form of Unitarianism. So there are, <laughs> and it's it, it's interesting, by the way, because uh, I uh, w uh, listened to you the other day talking about this particular person and how some Christians like him just for the fact that he is somehow attacking Islam or or discouraging people from following Islam, and they overlook the important issue here, which is the whole doctrine he believes in anyway is not biblical. Hundred percent. And I want to remind people why this is important. <clears throat> you have people who are ignorant. Of what the Bible teaches, ignorant of what the Trinity teaches. So you may have a oneness or a modalist who is a oneness or modalist out of ignorance because he or she doesn't know better, doesn't know what the Trinity is or its biblical basis. Those are different from those individuals who have studied what the Trinity teaches, know what the doctrine entails, have heard the biblical evidence for the Trinity and still oppose it, still reject it, still condemn it, as false. Those individuals are not Christians. They're not brothers and sisters. They're under the wrath of God until they repent. And our prayer is they repent. Otherwise, they'll be damned. So I like to make a distinction between those who are ignorant, because after all, Al, you and I both know, Muslims are ignorant of the Quran and their traditions. Trinitarians are ignorant of the Bible and what they're supposed to believe. So if I go to a Trinitarian church, and if I ask a Trinitarian about the Trinity, I won't be shocked if he or she starts sounding like a oneness heretic or modalist because most people are ignorant of their own religious tradition. And it's not just true about Trinitarians. Muslim, you know that. <clears throat> How many Muslims you knew who had no clue what the Quran taught or what the son of Muhammad entailed? How many did you know? A lot. I mean, I, I wouldn't argue, uh, I wouldn't exaggerate if I say more than 70, 80% of them probably. So that's no different from any other group out there. So I'm going to make a distinction between those who are ignorant, and may God have mercy on them. They're not directly opposing the Trinity because they don't know what the Trinity is to oppose it. From those who have heard what the Trinity is, have heard presentations on the Trinity and the biblical evidence, and still oppose it and condemn it as a false doctrine, those are not my brothers and sisters. Those are my enemies and tools of the devil until they repent. And why is it important? 2 Corinthians 11, verses 1 of 4. Specifically, verses 2 to 4. In fact, if you want to read it for us, go to 2 Corinthians 11, verses 2 to 4, to see why. And I'm. this is now an exhortation to the Trinitarians. You Trinitarians who love the Bible and love the Trinity, here's why you cannot tolerate with any other view of God, even if it claims to be Christian or comes from someone who claims to be a Christian. Here's why. 2 Corinthians 11, brother, if you don't mind, I'll stop you at key points, verses 2 to 4. Very good. So verse two, for I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to <laughs> present you as a pure version to Christ. But I am afraid that as the servant deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Yep. Verse four. <clears throat> For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily <clears throat> enough. Now, Christians, please, I exhort you for the love of Christ. Listen to what Paul said. He's talking to the Corinthians 
that by the grace of God, he led to saving faith in Christ. <clears throat> so he says, and he said this in 1 Corinthians, by the way. In 1 Corinthians 4, verses 14 and 15, he says to the Corinthians, Though you may have many tutors in Christ, you only have one father. I have become your father through the gospel. What does he mean? Believe it or not, folks, if you bring someone to salvation through the preaching gospel, the Bible says you become that person's spiritual father, spiritual mother. So Paul says, I birthed you spiritually. How? When I preached the gospel, you believe, you became my spiritual offspring. And so now you are my virgin daughter. Notice the language. He's describing the Corinthian believers as a virgin bride betrothed to a husband, wedding for the wedding ceremony and consummation. This is a spiritual marriage. It's a spiritual consummation, not physical, not sexual. And he says, you are my virgin daughter. I now betroth you to Christ as a spiritual virgin. <clears throat> now, here's the thing. I don't want Jesus to show up and find you no longer a virgin. That's the language. Now, you may wonder, how can someone lose their spiritual virginity? He says, this is how. Satan, the serpent, just like he seduced Eve, who was a virgin, to disobey God and bring God's judgment. The serpent will also seduce you spiritually to lose your spiritual virginity and spiritual integrity. How? He's going to send people to preach another Jesus or <clears throat> present a different spirit or present a different gospel and you put up with it. If you do, that Satan seducing you and you're about to lose your spiritual virginity. Don't put up with it. You know what Paul is saying? Don't put up with the Muslim Jesus. That is a satanic counterfeit. Don't put up with the Unitarian Jesus. That's a satanic counterfeit. Don't put up with the oneness Jesus. These are not the true Jesuses we preached. These are satanic counterfeits <clears throat> erected by Satan to seduce you, to put up with it, if not accept it, and therefore lose your spiritual virginity and shame me when Christ comes. Don't put up with it. Now he adds something else. He adds a caveat. Many people think that if you're kind and you're loving and you're gentle, that is a sure mark that you're a disciple of Christ. After all, you've heard it. And not you. I mean, so you've heard about me, maybe even Christian Prince or Salma Dr. Dok or David. We're kind of harsh. We're sometimes too cruel. Or we're too mean and we're loud. I don't see the spirit in them. Now, let me show you what Paul says about that. Guys, pay attention. Paul says one of the tricks of Satan is to inspire and raise up men that give the pretense of being very pious, very spiritual, very humble, being righteous. But that's his way of deceiving you into trusting them because Satan knows that if he comes up straight up with poison, you're not, not going to take it. But if he gives you poison that's covered with chocolate that's pleasing to the eyes, you're more than likely to take it and be killed by it because I want you to read in 2 Corinthians 11, same chapter, 2 right. Corinthians 11, verses 13 to 15. Same chapter. <clears throat> yep, and, and those are uh, some of my favorite uh, passages to show that when people say a, a spirit appeared to Muhammad, I point this out to them. Yep. So here's what it says, verse 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen disguising themselves as apostles of Christ and no wonder for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light so go all the way to yeah. 15 so uh, verse 15 so it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness mm -hmm. their end will correspond to their deeds Understand what he said. Even Satan can appear as an angel of light to deceive you. Why are you shocked that his servants, his ministers, those empowered by him, would give the pretense of being righteous, <clears throat> promoting righteousness, promoting purity, <clears throat> promoting self-control? Because that's how Satan gets you. So notice what he says. Satan's scheme is he's going to inspire folks to look humble, to look pious, to look righteous. To look like they're very compassionate and loving. But that's Satan's way of disarming you to trust that person as he damns you with the false gospel. In other words, it's not the person and his appearance or his personality or his decorum that counts. What counts is the message that comes out of his mouth. 
In fact, we have some Christians here who know history that can confirm whether I'm right or wrong. But I've been told and I've actually read that Arius, the fourth century heretic, <clears throat> who said Jesus was the first creation of the Father. According to what I've read, Arius was very pleasant, very humble, very gentle, and very handsome to look at. Whereas Athanasius, who was the Trinitarian warrior, was very rough and rugged and harsh. In fact, according to tradition, this is tradition again, and there's no reason for me to deny the tradition that this tradition was made up. <clears throat> at the Council of Nicaea, Santa Claus was present. I don't know if you know this. Santa Claus was there because Santa Claus <clears throat> is built on an actual Christian saint, a Trinitarian, by the name of Saint Nicholas. According to tradition, you can look this up, and there's no reason to belie the tradition that it's simply make-believe, right? I have no reason to reject it. Saint Nicholas at the council could not handle the blasphemies that was coming out of Arius' mouth. Even though Athanasius was using scripture to silence him and showing scripture wasn't on his side, but was on the side of the Trinitarian, Saint Nicholas got so angry that he, he hit him right in the mouth, smacked him right in the mouth, and he was thrown in prison because of that. So notice the Trinitarians were the ones who were rough and rugged and mean, but the tool of Satan, the son of Satan, the agent of Satan was very humble, very articulate, and very well-mannered, and was good-looking. So that's not a criterion to determine whether someone is a child of God. How do you know someone's a child of God? In spite of his rough edges, what is the message that he preaches? So I can be rough and preach the truth. And then you can have someone who's humble and be spewing lies of the devil. It's the message, not the person. It's the message, not the messenger that you need to focus on for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Amen, brother. And I love the idea that we're not good looking. I love that. So you definitely uh, are not. That's what yeah, mean. I know. I know that. I'm thankful for that, actually. You just proved that I'm not a heretic. So we have <laughs> one here by the name Gina Valentine. Do you know anything about her? Before no, from your okay, I, so I think so I'm, gonna put, I'm gonna put her comment right here. I mean, we, we want to thank Gina for asking this question. She does tell you up front she's a Unitarian. Okay, so here's what she's saying Please don't shoot me, uh, shoot an arrow at me, but I am a oneness Pentecostal. Okay, oh, I don't okay. call Trinitarian heretics or ignorance. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. With this being said, can you please explain why Jesus told disciple, yeah. make disciples and baptize all nation in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Yet, yet supposedly she's she's pointing out a, a, a <laughs> discrepancy here, as if that's yeah. what happened. Yet the disciple uh, the, the basically baptized in the name of Jesus. It's an excellent question. You know, that's the question that you get asked all the time, of course. <clears throat> so, brother, go ahead. Yeah. Now, notice, guys, she just proved my point. No disrespect to Gina. Do you see how gently she comes off? How sweet and humble and loving? And you know what's sad? Most Trinitarians would fall for it and feel sorry and say, oh, yeah, we love you too. Gina, let me be very upfront with you. You do not worship my God. I do not worship your God. If I'm right, you're a daughter of the devil. No matter how nice you are, how kind you are, how congenial you may be. But she now, glory to God. Guys, I want you to see, this is, I believe, of the Lord. The Lord, I believe in his timing, allowed this to happen because you see how nice she comes up. Please don't shoot me. And, you know, we Trinitarians, oneness. Yeah, you know, it's the same God because I was looking at the comment basically that she was getting at. No, it's not. Gina, let me be up front. You can be the sweetest gal in the world and you're still a daughter of Satan on your way to hell. We just read that, 2 Corinthians eleven fifteen. So you being nice has nothing to do with it. It's nothing personal. It's about the glory and zeal of God. Your God is not my God. Let's be upfront. Let's not kid ourselves. You worship a different God than I do. Because notice also what she said, because I was looking at the comment, the part where they also receive the same Holy Spirit. And this is for the Trinitarians here. The, the oneness think that just because they speak in tongues, because one of the signs of these heretics who worship a false God, especially the UP. <clears throat> United Pentecostal Church's UPC, is that when you get baptized in the name of Jesus, you need to speak in tongues as a sign that you are now baptized in the Holy Spirit. And many of these heretics and sons and daughters of the devil do speak in tongues. And they'll say, you see, we speak in tongues. That's proof we're worshiping the true God. No, all that proves is 
Satan, your father, has empowered you to speak in tongues in order to deceive you into thinking you now receive the true Holy Spirit. So this is another lesson. I'm going to answer her question, but I'm doing this more for oh, the sure, Christian. Sure, Christian. I like that. The Trinitarians yeah, yeah. And the Lord, Lord, by the way, told the Pharisees, your father is the devil. I mean, it's yes. not like you're bringing something new here. No, well, the reason why I'm saying this is because, unfortunately, and you can read the comments, my Trinitarian brothers and sisters are going to be duped by her kindness and say, oh, what a sweet girl. Sam, be nice to her. Folks, here's another lesson to learn. Yep, like Luisa Cambo said, you have even people in Kundalini that speak in tongues by the Kundalini spirit. Folks. The Bible says, do not be impressed by miracles, signs, or wonders. Because in Matthew 24, verses 23 to 25, Matthew 24, verses 23 to 25, Acts 17 just gave you $100 and said, I'm a bully. Thank you, uh, Haterwood. David, <clears throat> David Wood, man, my beloved. Yeah, yeah, he's got to be your beloved. Matthew 24, verses 23 to 25. Folks, pay attention. Jesus said, false Christs, false prophets will do signs, wonders, to deceive even the elect if we're possible. So, folks, let me exhort you if you love the Trinity. Do not be duped by tongues or miracles or signs or casting out demons because Jesus said even false prophets, false Christ will do it, and they still have nothing to do with me. They're the devil. Why? Because Satan and evil spirits are in the business of mimicking the gifts of the Holy Spirit, doing things like the Holy Spirit does them, in order to deceive people into thinking they have the truth, you are not speaking tongues by the true spirit. You're speaking tongues by an evil spirit that has possessed you to deceive you to damn your soul. The way you know whether the tongues is from God is if you have the right God. And sister in humanity, you have a false God. Your father is not my father. Your Jesus is not my Jesus. Your spirit is not the spirit that indwells me. You're deceived of the devil. So I just want to clear that out. So you can appeal to emotions. It's not going to get you anywhere with me. Let's be biblical. Now, to answer your question, this is, her, this is again, a classic argument of these heretics. They, Jesus said, baptize the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But in the book of Acts, they baptize people in the name of Jesus. So what's the name of the Father? Jesus. What's the name of the Son? Jesus. What's the name of the Holy Spirit? Jesus. You see their argument? So let's ignore the... Tons and tons of verses that show the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father, but these three are distinct and in fellowship with one another, in love with one another, even before creation. Let's ignore all that. Let's ignore it all. Let's focus on some ambiguous statements in the book of Acts to try to deceive people into thinking, see, baptize the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit means baptize the name of Jesus. So here's my challenge to these oneness heretics. Here's my challenge. I challenge you, and I've yet to have anyone meet the challenge. I just did a debate with Roger Perkins. And again, I don't want to boast. Glory to God, it was a decimation. He got exposed for being a heretic, that he is, who tried to butcher the Hebrew and Greek to his fail and shame. And God willing, it's coming out. It's coming out this week in two parts. You be the judge. He tried to use such pathetic arguments. But here's the fact, and here's my challenge to Gina. Gina, here's my challenge to you. Quote me a single passage. And by the way, you can hear my debates with the late Stephen Ritchie. I had two debates with him. Does the Trinity teach the Old Testament? Does the Trinity teach the New Testament? It's on Acts 17 apologetics. And again, if I'm going to be honest, he got decimated because you can't defend a false god and a lie because the scriptures are your enemy. So go watch it. Watch them. Here's my challenge to you, Gina. And please quote a verse to refute me. Here's my challenge to you, Gina. I want you to quote a single verse in the entire New Testament, specifically Acts, which you appeal to, that when they immerse someone in water, when they immerse someone in water, they pronounce, I baptize you in the name of Jesus. I'm looking for the baptismal formula because the passages that you cited are not formulas that they uttered at baptism. They're simply invoking the authority of Christ. In the name of Jesus means get baptized for the sake of Jesus, because of Jesus, as a sign that you're submitting to the lordship of Jesus. That's all it is. It's All it's saying is Amen. when you get Amen. baptized, your baptism is done because Jesus commands you. 
And if you believe Jesus is Lord, you obey his command and do it for his sake. That's all it's saying. No more, no less. But here is my challenge to you. Show me that when they did get baptized as a sign, they acknowledge Christ's authority to command them because now they submit to him as their Lord, who now has the right to tell them what to do and when to do it, that when they got immersed in water, the formula, I baptize the name of Jesus, was uttered from any mouth of any apostle or disciple. Show me where they invoke the same formula that you heretics and children of the devil invoke when you baptize someone. It's not there. You won't find it. End of story. But prove me wrong, Gina. Go ahead. Yep. Gina, it's only 28 chapters, the book of Acts. You can use Siri. Siri can do an amazing job for you. So if you find it before we end, please post it for us here. Yeah. And hey, by the way, uh, Sam, you know, so David gives $100. Thank you. Yeah. And then Islam Critique gives, tops it by 50. So where is yours, man? We need the 25 from you, bro. I'm getting the mail because you're local. By the way, I want to correct Spirit of Love. We, we have another hey, watch. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you. Hey, we have another uh, lovey-dovey, washy evangelifish using the term Rob Mori. They need education, Sam, not condemnation. Spirit of Love, get a life, my friend. It's obvious you have not engaged oneness, modalists, or Muslims because the last thing they do is want your love. What they do is they attack you. They attack your God. They mock your God. They blaspheme your God. We don't need spineless evangelifishes. If this is how you want to evangelize, keep it to yourself. Leave what yeah. we do to us. They need love, fam. They yeah, yeah, need I mean, it, to fam. So, but it before amazes you go, me. But, it amazes me, Sam. Yeah. You know, they need to go to Matthew 23 and reconcile that to, for Thank us. You. Yeah, yeah, but see, uh, see come on, see, it's the uh, Al Fadi. See, you can't quote Jesus in Matthew 23 because Jesus was in love and he was condemning him. Or you can't quote Acts 13, 6 to 12, where Peter, where Paul rebuked the son of Satan for opposing gospel, saying, you son of the devil, and cursed him to be blinding. No, brother, that's not the spirit of love. You need love. All right, let's go to the next one. I think we need to do uh, a live stream on the meaning of name because there is a lot of misunderstanding sometimes. People think the word name means literally pronouncing the name when, when, when in case it's that's not the case. It's the authority. It's the whole person. And I think we need to do something like that. Keep going, brother. Brother, it's simple, simple as day. Read the book of Acts. I challenge anyone to show me where this was the baptismal formula because what she's trying to show you is when they immerse someone in the act of immersion, they said, I baptize in the name of Jesus. You will not find a single scene in Acts where they invoke in the name of Jesus, I baptize you when they're actually doing the baptizing. So if you read it carefully, when it says repent and be baptized, every one of you and every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, in the context, what he's saying is you who crucified Jesus and condemned him as a false Messiah. Now get baptized and turn to him as a sign. You now submit to him. You accept his lordship over your life. So you do it for his sake because he commanded you and you acknowledge his authority to tell you what you do as repentance of your public condemnation and handing him over to be killed and crucified. That's all it means. No more or less. Amen. Prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. Amen. So, brother, why is it dangerous then? When we talk about a, uh, a Unitarian view, for instance, when it comes to salvation or when it comes to just the belief in God in general. I mean, I just want people to understand, especially Muslims who are tracking with us. Yeah. The reason why is because Jesus himself says salvation comes from knowing truly, knowing intimately and being loved with the God that exists. For example, in John 8, 24, John chapter 8, verse 24, what did Jesus say? He goes, Unless you believe I am he, you shall die in your sins. Let me repeat again. Unless you believe I am he, you shall die in your sins. That's number one. John 17, verse 3. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the true, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So Jesus says, salvation comes from the true God. Salvation comes from the object of your saving faith. Who is the one that you're trusting in, hoping in, looking to, in love with to save you? The wrong God. You put your hope in the wrong God. 
you can't be saved. You put your hope in the wrong Jesus, you can't be saved. So Jesus himself says, Jesus himself says, this is salvation. To know who I am. I am he. You are what? The Muslim Isa who announced the coming of Ahmed, the son of Satan, Muhammad, or the Mormon Jesus who is the elder brother of Lucifer, right? The spiritual sexual offspring, not spiritual, but sexual offspring of God the Father. Knowing what? That Jesus, the man who came into existence in his mother's womb, Jesus, the archangel Michael, the first of Jehovah, God's creation. So Jesus says, you need to know the God who is, and you need to know the God who saves you as he is revealed in scripture. You will not be saved by believing in another God that's not the God who's revealed in scripture. For example, if I say Al-Fadi, I know Al-Fadi. He's one of my best friends. And I said to Al-Fadi, I know he's six foot five inches. He's got a full set of blonde hair. He's got 24-inch pythons and a six-pack. You're going to say, that's not me, brother. Yeah, it is you, Al-Fadi. No, look at me. I'm 5'5". Five, five. Are you 5'5"? Five, five? I don't know. Ball, right? And I don't have a six-pack. I have a kick. No, brother, that's not Al-Fadi. Al-Fadi is 6'5". He's my best friend. You're going to think I'm Looney Tunes. You're going to say, dude, you're weird. You're deranged. You're demented. That's not me. Now, that's basically what you're doing with God. You're telling me that God is this when in reality he's not that. You have a God that doesn't exist, a God that Satan created, a God of your overactive imagination. That God cannot save you. The God who saves you is the God revealed in the Bible, and you have to accept him as he is on his own terms and love the God that actually exists, not the God of your own liking and your own making. Your God, the God of your imagination, cannot save you. That's why. Amen. So, brother, another thing I want people to be aware of, there is a connection between uh, Unitarianism, of course, and modalism or Sabellianism. Okay, so this is a heresy. You want to shed some light on that? There was in the ancient church that was condemned by church fathers like Tertullian and others, the belief what we call today Sabellianism, <clears throat> the belief that the father became man and he suffered. And this was known as patri <clears throat> passionism. The father suffered on the cross because Jesus is simply the human nature, human manifestation of the father. Now, what's ironic is that this heresy was already condemned and done away with in the early church. And you know how the early church refuted this heresy? Folks, this is why in my debate with Stephen Ritchie and Roger Perkins, we went to the Old Testament. Do you know how the church fathers, our spiritual ancestors, these mighty men and women of faith, these holy servants of God, who loved the Lord, lived for him, preached, and even died as martyrs for his glory. You know how they refuted it? They went into the Hebrew scriptures to show that even in the Hebrew scriptures, even in the Hebrew Bible, the prophets proclaim, announce a multi-personal God. For example, Tertullian went to passages where you have two divine persons in fellowship with each other. Do you know one of the passages that Tertullian quoted to refute <clears throat> Sabellianism? was Genesis 19, 24. There he shows there's a Lord on earth. Job. Wow, it's amazing. I'm not lying to you. Tertullian quotes that. Yeah. He quotes, there's a Jehovah on earth bringing fire and sulfur from another Lord, Jehovah in heaven. And that was one of the texts he used to show personal distinctions in the Godhead, even from the Old Testament. You know, also use that, but he used it in a different context. He used it against the Jews. Justin Martyr. And it's still found online. Still found. Guys, if you want to read the Church Fathers online, you can go right. to New Advent, which is an online Catholic encyclopedia and has all the fathers in English translation. Look up Justin Martyr, Dialogue with Trifo the Jew. Justin Martyr, Dialogue with Trifo the Jew. When you go there, one of the passages he quotes, he quotes Genesis 19.24. He quotes... Where the Lord is on earth, bringing fire and sulfur from the Lord out of heaven. In other words, the use of Genesis 19.24 by Anthony Rogers, by David Wood, by you, by me, is not new. It is one of the passages that the church has been using from its inception. From as long back as we can go, we find church fathers using these passages that we use today to prove the Trinity in the Old Testament which confirms what Solomon said, even though he said it in a different context. Nothing new under the sun. He's right. 
Everything that we're saying now was set before us, and all the heresies we encounter now were already being encountered before us. It's the same heresy, but packaged slightly differently. Modalism is an ancient heresy. Joe's Witnesses is an ancient heresy. It's the Arianism of the 21st century. So the church fathers were already combating all these heretics and heresies. They even combated a form of humanitarian Unitarianism because there was a group from the late second century onwards that believed Jesus was just a man who became the divine son of God at baptism. So these heresies were already being spread and dealt with and decimated and refuted by our spiritual ancestors, the diehard Trinitarians who knew that God is triune, knew the scriptures, point to a triune God and use the scriptures to silence those heresies. But unfortunately, they are now resurfacing, repackaging slightly differently, but the same lie that was condemned in previous centuries. And by the way, Al, yes, another, another way that Tertullian and others like him used to prove that modalism is a lie and that the Trinity is true, they went to the Old Testament and pointed to the angel of the Lord. And not only did Tertullian do that, Justin Martyr in his debate with Trifo the Jew. Don't take my word for it. You'll find this in Justin, in Tertullian. You'll find this in Cyril. All these great men of the church whose writings have been preserved by the grace of the triumph God. They would look to the angel of the Lord and say, this angel is not a creature. He's a messenger sent by God to proclaim his message, who is the word of God, who is the Son of God, who is the Lord Jehovah, who is God, who then becomes Jesus the Messiah. So they were using right. the same arguments. See, in other words, as brilliant as Anthony Rogers is, and he is, he's simply parroting the arguments that those who came before him used to glorify the trying God, men and women more brilliant than Anthony or you or me could ever be, holier, holy slaves of God, sold out for Jesus, who tried to live for Jesus and died as martyrs for the glory of Christ. So what's my point to, the, to every one of you? Do you want to destroy modalism? Do you want to destroy Unitarianism? Do you want to destroy Joe's Witnesses? Learn the Old Testament foundation for the Trinity. Learn the arguments from the Old Testament that shows that even the prophets knew God is triune, there's more than one divine person, and one of those persons becomes the flesh and blood, Jesus Christ. And if you want, we can talk about that. Is yeah, there please. evidence in the Old Testament that shows that one of those persons that was already existing in the Old Testament, who's not the Father, becomes Jesus? Very easy. We can do Amen. it. Amen. Amen. Let me, let me say this. I want to I give a, a stern warning to people that if we ignore heresies— and we, if, if we play this nice card, and by the way, Gina is blocked out of my Facebook. I don't allow heretics on my Facebook at all. So mm -hmm. if you guys want to have a conversation with Gina, you can go there to Gina. In my, my Facebook, I do not allow heresies, period. So uh, basically, here is what, what I want to say. There was a heresy called partialism. Partialism, where it believes that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one third of, of like a one being. Guess who talked about this? The Quran. Do you see how things like this can make their way into other beliefs and somehow Muslims look at us as if that's what we believe in? Exactly. Now, someone just brought up Acts 8.16. Bible facts. If I have to refute that passage, you know, but you and I are going to have trouble. You know why? Because you say you're a Trinitarian. Being baptized into the name of Jesus Christ, which part wasn't cleared? That, that means they got baptized for the sake of Jesus on the authority of Jesus. So now, Bible facts. Get your facts straight. Show me in Acts 8 where when they were dumped in the water, he said, I baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ. I thought it was clear. I, again, help guys, help me. Was my point clear? Quoting a passage that says they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Let me repeat what it means. It means they got baptized under the authority of Jesus for the sake of Jesus by the command of Jesus. In other words, they did this for Christ's sake. They did this because Christ commanded them. And what was the sign that they were submitting to Jesus' lordship? Obeying what he commands. So Bible facts. Did you get your facts straight? Understand what I'm saying what I'm not saying? I, I thought I was clear. So now Bible facts. I want to challenge you 
to be the oneness defender and hero, though you claim to be a Trinitarian, show me in the narrative when they were dumped in the water that the formula he uttered was, I baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ. Let me repeat so you don't tax straw man and try to come to their aid and only embarrass yourself. Being baptized into the name of Jesus Christ means they did this act of baptism for the sake of Christ because Christ had authorized those who believe in him to get baptized. This was a command of Christ. So they did it because Christ commanded them for his sake as a sign. They're acknowledging him as Lord, worthy of their obedience to him. I don't know. Was I clear, guys? Help me. Again, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, and I may not be the clearest communicator. I'm not as clear as David would. Not. He's probably the worst communicator known to mankind. He cures insomnia. And I wasn't born yesterday. As I tell people, I was born the day before. Can you show me the baptismal formula? Not they got baptized. In other words, they did this on behalf of Christ for the sake of Christ to obey the command of Christ as their sign, as a sign that they're submitting to Christ's lordship. So Amen. stop being the Amen. defender of oneness. You're going to embarrass yourself and them in the process. Stay Trinitarian on me, brother, from a different mother. Oh, go ahead. Amen. Okay, brother. So where, where do you want to go to address this? Yeah, I want to show that Jesus is not the father, but he's the angel of the Lord who became Amen. flesh so that Jesus has always been a distinct person from the father, even in the Old Testament. So, folks. One of the most powerful ways of decimating these heresies, especially modalism, is to show that angel of the Lord, who's not the Father, but he's sent by God the Father, who's a messenger, not a creature, who happens to be God, is none other than Jesus Christ. Let me show that to you. Go to Malachi 3, verse 1. <clears throat> and this, by the way, I want to repeat, this is not a new argument that Anthony or I invented. This has been the argument of the early church from day one. Okay. Yeah, and then people, this is one of the most powerful arguments ever in the Bible. When Sam shared it with me a couple of years ago, I was blown away by how clear it was. So I pray that you'll be blessed by it. So you want me to read verse one, now, brother? Before you do that, I think Lu Wing Kang is joking when he quotes Acts 2.38. Well, real quickly again, guys, because again, I'm going to give him a benefit of doubt that I'm the one stupid and he's not the one hard of hearing. Acts 2, 3, 8, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If I challenge this guy without looking at the Bible, what the context is, he wouldn't be able to tell me the context. Let me tell you the context of Acts 2, 3, 8 real quickly. Jesus, Peter, I should say, speaking on behalf of Jesus, has just got done saying Acts 2, 36. <clears throat> Acts 2, 36. He just got done saying that this Jesus, whom you crucify, God has made both Lord and Christ. Did you catch it? You Jews. And if you go earlier in Acts 2.22, it says, You, by the hands of lawless men, hand them over to be killed. Acts 2.22, 36. Guys, understand the context. You Jews handed Jesus over to be killed. You crucified him. And then it says in Acts 2.37, they got convicted, pierced at the heart. What should we do now that we realize our sin and shame and handing Jesus over to be killed publicly. We publicly condemn them to death. We're ashamed. We realize we're mistaken. So what does Peter say? Now get baptized into the name of Jesus Christ to be forgiven. What's his point? You publicly condemned Jesus and rejected Jesus publicly to be killed. Now get baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. And notice it didn't just say baptize. Repent. Meaning now turn to this Jesus whom you publicly condemn to be killed. And because he has commanded those who believe in him to be baptized, get baptized for his sake as a sign. You are wrong for what you did. And you realize he is no false Messiah. He is the Lord whom God raised and you submit to his Lordship. In other words, Acts 2.38 is saying, be baptized because Jesus commanded you to. And if you right. believe he is Lord and not a false Messiah, Honor him by doing it for his sake. That's what it Amen. means into the name of Jesus. I don't know how much clear I can make it. In the mean, for his sake, on his behalf, because he authorizes it. And do you are you ashamed of what you did? Yes. Do you repent of what you did? Yes. Then now get baptized for his sake on his behalf because he commands it. And that will be a sign you acknowledge you're wrong and accept his lordship. 
Again, Amen. you failed miserably to show me that it is a baptismal formula. Everyone else gets it, but these heretics don't. May the Holy Spirit grant them mercy and open their eyes and ears to see and understand. But go ahead, brother. Maybe you, maybe you should say it in Assyrian. I'll say it in Arabic. Maybe yeah, that will be better. clearer. <laughs> exactly. Okay. But Malachi 3, one. what does it say? So verse 1, Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Okay, now, I don't blame the Geneva, uh, Geneva Bible writers. I blame you for misinterpreting because you're a son and tool of the devil. But coming back to you guys, Malachi 3.1, notice what God said who's coming. Malachi 3 verse 1, notice who said, is, uh, who's, who is said to come as the Lord Jesus blesses this session and loosens our tongues to speak clearly. Malachi 3, 1, God says, I'm going to send an angel because the word messenger is the Hebrew word malach. Malach means angel. And I get, and by the way, Anthony Rogers, I think, dealt with this in one of your shows. <clears throat> so I'm just piggy, piggyback off what he said. Okay, now pay attention here. God says, I'm going to send a messenger. Hebrew, malach. That's the word angel. I'm sending an angel ahead of me to prepare for my way, suddenly after that angel messenger comes, the Lord will come to his temple, who is the messenger of the covenant. Guys, understand what the prophecy says. One messenger will be sent. The word in Hebrew is malach. Don't take my word for it. The word malach is the same word we get angel because the word angel only means messenger. That's all it means. It doesn't necessarily mean a spirit creature with wings. The Hebrew word for angel and the Greek word for angel, malach and angelos, means messenger. So God says, I'm going to send one angel, and he's going to prepare my way, and then someone else shows up. That someone else is the Lord, ha'adon, a phrase only used of Jehovah, and that Lord is going to come to his temple, and that temple is built only for Jehovah. So the Lord is coming to that temple, and this Lord is the messenger of the covenant. Folks, don't take my word for it. The word messenger is malach, covenant is brit. The messenger of the covenant, the word messenger is the word angel. So you can translate it as the angel of the covenant whom you seek, whom you desire is coming. So who's coming? The Lord who is the angel of the covenant is coming to his temple. Which Lord? The angel of the covenant. The angel who mediates the covenant. The angel who made the covenant with Israel. He is coming. Now, right. who is this angel? Go to Judges chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. Judges 2. And, and folks, I, I advise you to write these things down, folks. We started with Malachi 3, verse 1. Now we're going to go to Judges 2. two verses 1 to 5. <clears throat> yeah, again, let me correct Mark Searle as you go there. Nestorians, the ones that are called Nestorians are the Assyrian Church of the East the church of my ancestors, they are not Nestorians in that they don't believe there is a divine person called Christ and a human Jesus that united. No Assyrian church, theologian, scholar, priest, bishop affirms that. They affirm that the one Christ is one eternal person with a divine nature and a human nature and divine characteristics that go with the divine nature and human characteristics that go with that human nature. And to prove that they are not guilty of that Nestorian heresy, guys, listen to me. Don't take my word for it. 1994, the then patriarch, patriarch of the Assyrian Church of the East, which is called Nestorian, met with the then Pope, John Paul, and they sat down and they wrote a Christological confession of faith where they both acknowledge that they both have the same view of the Trinity and Jesus Christ. And it's online. So stop the nonsense of accusing the Assyrian Church of the East, the Assyrian Apostolic Catholicos Church of the East of being Nestorians, they are not. Let's end this nonsense. Let's focus for the glory of Jesus Christ. Mark Cyril, then you don't know what you're talking about because there are now books that have been found that Nestorius himself did not believe in a divine person, Christ, and a human person, Jesus, that united. The exactly. Christ is one divine exactly. person who took on a human nature, why he was condemned? Because he refused to call Mary the mother of God. He said it's more appropriate to call her the mother of Christ. But that's another topic for another time. Mark Cyril, 
Why are you here distracting the focus? Focus, my brother, from a different mother like no other. Now, Judges 2, verses 1 of 5. Who is the angel of the covenant that Malachi says would come to his temple who is the Lord? Who is the angel of the covenant? Judges chapter 2, verses 1 of 5. Okay, let's read it. Uh, uh, Judges 2, verses 1 to 5. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim. And the angel said, of the Lord, right? Right. The angel okay, of the Lord. Lord. Yes. And he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides and their gods shall be a snare to you. Mm -hmm. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept. Yeah. And they called the name of that place Bochim, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. Now, folks, before we unpack this, we have another gentleman who's speaking out of ignorance, nothing least. He says that Jesus' name in his premium existence was Metatron. Now, I'm going to ask this gentleman. See, this is why, Al, I main, maintain a type ship on my YouTube channel, because you got people spousing so much ignorance. It's almost sad, if not disgusting. I'm going to ask nothing least to show me the oldest reference to Metatron and to show me the word Metatron in the Hebrew Bible. Metatron is not used in the Hebrew Bible, and it's not the name of Jesus in his pre-human existence. But for the rest of you, here's what I want you to focus. Judges 2, verses 1 to 5. Al read it. Please focus. Don't let Satan distract you. Judges 2, verses 1 to 5. The angel of the Lord came and told the Israelites, I swore to your fathers that I would bring you out of the land. I, the angel, made that oath to your fathers. And I swore that I would never break my covenant with you. Notice the angel says, it's my covenant that I made with you. And I'm the one who swore to your fathers that I would bring you, their descendants, into the land and make my covenant with you. Did you catch it? The angel said, I'm the one who made the covenant. I'm the one who mediated the covenant. I'm the one who made the promise to your fathers. I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt into the land. It's my covenant, my promise, and I fought for you, but you dishonored me, and now I will let the inhabitants be a thorn in your side. So here's the angel claiming that he is the God of the covenant. It's my covenant, claiming to be the God of the patriarchs because I'm the one who spoke to them, made the promise that I'd make a covenant with their descendants, you, and I'm the God who brought you out of Egypt into the land. So here's the angel of the covenant who is clearly not a creature sent by God who happens to be God. And according to Malachi 3 verse 1, the Lord coming to his temple is the angel of the covenant, meaning the angel of God who made the covenant with Israel, who swore to the forefathers, who brought Israel out of Egypt into the promised land. That angel was to show up after God sent a messenger before him to prepare his way. Now, one more example, <clears throat> one more example. Judges 13, <clears throat> 17 to 18. Watch this, <clears throat> guys. Judges this is the story of this Manoah. This is the story of Manoah and uh, Samson. Yep. Okay. So mm -hmm. which verses you said? Judges 13. Guys, you guys, don't let them distract you in the comment section. I want you to focus on the meat. I'm proving that Jesus is the what, angel of God. Sam. Who existed before he became man, distinct from the Father who became Jesus. Go ahead, brother. You're familiar with some of these distractors. Mention their names, and I want the moderators to bounce them out. Christian Finland needs to go because he's a nuisance of the devil. He tried to distract me in my comment section. He's doing it here because he's not here to learn. He's here to pontificate, so he goes bye-bye. Now, Judges 13, 17, 18, Manoah and his wife, the parents of Samson. Manoah's wife is pregnant with Samson. The angel of God appears to them as a man. They know he's a man of God, instructing them what they're to do with the child, but they still are not fully certain that this angel, this man is the angel of God. They're not fully certain. They know he's a man. He appears in human form. He's a man sent by God. Then they realize he's the angel of God after he does something astonishing. Judges 13 verses 17 to 18. All right. We're going to read 17. 
And you, you guys need to go back later and read the whole chapter to make sense uh, uh, why this is important. In verse 17, it says, And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name? So that when your words come true, uh, we may honor you. Verse 18, And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask me? Uh, ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? You want me to stop here? I'll stop right there. This angel, when he's asked what his name is, Unlike, let's say, Raphael in the book of Tobit, which many Catholics, Orthodox read as canonical, unlike Gabriel in Daniel or in Luke 1, and unlike Michael, doesn't identify his name. He doesn't say, this is my name. Gabriel says, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, right? So on and so forth. This angel, when he's asked his name, now notice, they don't know he's an angel. They think he's a man of God. So they ask him, what is your name? So we can honor you. Notice what... The angel says, why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? Wonderful. The word wonderful there is, is pali. Now, let me explain the significance of this. When you ask someone his name, you're not simply asking for his name in the sense like my name is Sam. Name in the Bible can refer to the nature of a thing, the characteristics of a thing, to the authority of a thing. So notice his response. Why do you ask me about my being, my nature, my character, it is wonderful. Look at any Hebrew lexicon. The word wonderful means it is beyond comprehension, beyond understanding. Now, what mere creature, what mere creature would say, don't inquire about my nature, my characteristics, because it's beyond comprehension, beyond understanding. That's only true of God. Yet this angel who appears as a man says, don't try to inquire about my character. It's beyond understanding, beyond your ability to comprehend. But then who is this man that's beyond comprehension? Judges 13, verses 17 to 18. Judges 13, I'm sorry, 21 to 22. My apologies. You just read Judges 13, 17, 18? That's read right. Judges 13, 21 to 22. So the same chapter, verse 21 says, The angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord, and Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die, for we have seen God. Okay, read 21 one more time. Well, 21. The angel Ooh. of the Lord yes. appeared Sorry. no more to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. Verse Pause, 22. Right there. Pause right there. Notice, folks, it says Manoah realized... This was no ordinary man. This man is the angel of the Lord. Notice what it did not say. It did not say he realized and knew this was the Lord, Jehovah. He knew it was the messenger of Jehovah. So he knew this was the messenger of Jehovah appearing as a man. But then explain to me why he says what he says in verse 22. Verse 22 says, And Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die, for we have seen God. Wait, wait, wait. For the one who asked me, where's the Trinity in the Old Testament? If he was listening, he wasn't a dense. I just gave it. Folks, walk, walk through with the argumentation. Walk with me through the argumentation. It says, here's a man, and Manoah realized this is no ordinary man. He knew it was the angel of the Lord. Angel of the Lord, that's two. The Lord and his angel's messenger. But then he said, we're going to die because we saw God. But wait, Manoah, the man you saw is the angel of the Lord. So he is the messenger sent by the Lord. That's two. Why do you think that when you saw the angel, you saw God? You know why? Because the angel of the Lord is not a creature. He is God who appears visibly, often as a man, sent by God. So there are two divine persons. And this angel of the Lord, who is God, appearing as a man, he's the one who made the covenant with Israel, the mediator of the covenant. And Malachi 3.1 says... This is the angel who is coming. Malachi 3.1 says, The angel of the covenant whom you desire, who is the Lord coming to his temple, he will show up. So who's going to show up? The angel of the Lord. What angel? The messenger sent by God, who appears as a man, who's worshipped as God, who claims to be God, and does only what God can do. Now, folks, here's where it gets amazing. Malachi 3.1, chapter 3, verse 1, according to the New Testament, is referring to God sending John the Baptist as his messenger to prepare for Jesus Christ. Let's go to Matthew 11, verse 10, to see how Jesus interprets 
Malachi 3, verse 1. Jesus tells us, Malachi 3, 1, where God says, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of me. That messenger is John. John is sent ahead of the Lord, who's the angel of the covenant, to prepare for the coming of the Lord, the angel of the covenant. Matthew 11, verse 10. Matthew 11, verse 10. This is he of whom it is written. <clears throat> Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Now notice what Jesus said. John the Baptist, he's the one that Malachi said, God would send ahead of your way to prepare for your face. John the Baptist is the messenger sent to prepare for the angel of the covenant, the Lord who is to come to his temple. Folks, help me understand this. If John the Baptist is the messenger God sent to prepare the people for the coming of the angel of the covenant, who is the Lord coming to his temple. But John was sent to prepare for Jesus. Acts 19 verse 4. If you can read that for us, brother. Acts 19 verse 4. Then that means Jesus Christ is none other than the angel of the covenant, the Lord who owns the temple in Jerusalem. So here you have proof positive from the New Testament. Jesus is the angel of the covenant, the angel of the Lord, the angel of God, sent by God in the Old Testament, who appeared as a man, who, who was worshipped as God, whom others knew was God in human form, claims to be God and can do what only God does. Acts 19, verse 4, whom did John prepare the way for? Read it for us. Yep, and Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. Okay, now Al, work with me. John prepares for Jesus. Jesus says, John the Baptist is the messenger of Malachi 3.1. There are two. He's the first one where it says, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of me to prepare for my way. When he comes, expect suddenly right after him the Lord to show up in his temple who's the angel of the covenant. So if John is the messenger, he came. The prophecy says immediately, suddenly after him, the angel of the covenant will show up. But John the Baptist came and said, Jesus is coming. Jesus shows up. Who is Jesus then? Who is Jesus then? Can you help me? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I need to comment. Uh, uh, Gina Valentine, I can care less if you respect me or not. Heresies are not go, yeah. permitted go, go, go on any of my pages or channels. So you're out of my Facebook, and now you're gonna be out of my YouTube channel. Thank you for showing up and mentioning that as well. Now, for, um, yeah, but did everyone get it for the rest of you? Not only the Lord of his temple. Isn't this proof that Jesus is the angel of the covenant? Did everyone get it? I just wanna make sure we're doing it for you. I'm not doing it for Al, Al's not doing it for me. We know this stuff. For those of you listening in Facebook Live, which he's watching on YouTube, you understand that if John the Baptist is the messenger of Malachi 3.1, and that messenger prepares for the sudden appearance of the Lord coming to his temple as the angel of the covenant, and then we're told John the Baptist prepares for Jesus, do you now see irrefutable proof Jesus is the angel of the covenant? What angel? The angel of the Lord, the angel of God. Who is that angel? Not a creature, a messenger sent by God, who is God, who claims to be God, is worshiped as God and does what only God can do. So here is proof from the Old Testament. The one God is not one person. The one God is multi-personal. And one of those persons becomes flesh. But it's not the Father who became flesh. But the Father's messenger, his angel, Jesus Christ. This destroys not only modalism, but Unitarianism and all other isms that deny the Trinity. And the final line of evidence... Al, and then we can open up to other questions or whatever you want to do, because I'm free. Final line of evidence. You remember in Judges 13, 18, the angel said to Manoah, he didn't realize it was the angel. He thought it was just a man. He said to him, why do you ask my name, seeing it's wonderful? The word wonderful, pali, appears, or the, the word that comes from the same root. The word that comes from the same word where, where we get pali appears one other place. Go to Isaiah 9, verses yep. 6 to 7. Amen. Amen. Watch here. Okay. So Watch Isaiah here. 9, verse 6. Guys, pay attention to the word wonderful here. 
For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Wonderful Counselor. What else? Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now pause right there. Guys, a child born who is a son given. What are his names? Descriptive nouns describing his characteristics. He is the wonderful counselor. He's also the mighty God, El Gibor, a title used only for Jehovah in Isaiah, specifically in Isaiah 10, 21, where Jehovah said to be the mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Now understand this. The word wonderful counselor, the word wonderful is Pele. Pele. Wonderful. It comes from the same root as Pali. So notice. The angel of God says, my name is wonderful. The child who is born, he is wonderful in his counsels. The angel of God is God appearing in human form. The child born is the mighty God being born as a babe, being born in flesh. So notice the child is the mighty God and he's wonderful. The angel of God is God and he's wonderful and he appears as a man. In other words, if you connect the dots, the child born who's the son given, is none other than the angel of God being born as a babe, being born as a human being, which is why he's the mighty God, and that's the angel who becomes a son of David to sit on David's throne, as we find in verse 7. And here is where it gets even more amazing. Even we, more amazing. All of you Orthodox Christians who follow the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, your Greek version makes the identity of the child as the angel of God, more explicit. Because you know what the Greek version, first produced by Jews, says in Isaiah 9, 6? It says that the child born is the angel of the great council. Right? The angel of the great council. So even the Jews that translated Isaiah 9 into Greek understood that child, who's the mighty God, who's wonderful, is the, actually the angel and the word for counsel, boeles, can also mean the heavenly counsel or one who counsels you. So here you have the Greek version testifying. The child born is the angel of God who is wonderful beyond comprehension, who appears in human form, being born as the Messiah, the Messiah child to sit on David's throne. In other words, the Old and New Testaments agree Jesus is not the Father who becomes flesh. He's that angel Lord who's different from the Father who becomes flesh. Therefore, modalism is a satanic lie from the pit of hell. I hope that was clear to everyone. I hear you, brother. And by the way, we want to also uh, point out that the, uh, the term counselor here, uh, you can make a case that Jesus, when he sent us the Holy Spirit and says another, you know, helper, you can get that impression from that a counselor a comforter what's amazing about that every title that you find there about messiah is applied to jehovah elsewhere for example pele yoetz you'll find those terms used of jehovah in isaiah 25 verse 1 and isaiah 28 29 and isaiah 25 verse 1 and isaiah 28 29 right pele yoetz mighty god el gibor el gibor is used of jehovah in the next chapter isaiah 10 21 where it says he's the mighty God. A remnant will return to the mighty God, El Gibor. Even the word Ab, Avi, Ab, is used of Jehovah in Isaiah 63, 16, and Isaiah 64, verse 8. Isaiah 63, 16, Isaiah 64, 8. And that word Ad, eternity, is used for Jehovah in Isaiah 57, 15, where it says Jehovah inhabits Ad. So all those very terms are used for Jehovah elsewhere in Isaiah, Further reinforcing the fact the child born is Jehovah Almighty in the flesh, but he's not the father. And again, hope that was clear. Yeah. One last question, brother, because I know you're tired. And also uh, we have some people who are staying past midnight already. So I appreciate that. Prophecy, I don't know if you know this person or not, is asking this question. I'm curious, why does Isaiah call Jesus basically everlasting father uh, when Christ is the son? Oh, yeah. Even someone else asked me that, Mark Zero. Yes, guys, let me, I have an article on this on answeringislamblog.wordpress.com, answeringislamblog.wordpress.com. And also, I've done sessions on my YouTube channel. The phrase, Everlasting Father, and it comes up with my debate with Steve Stephen Ritchie, which you can watch on Acts 17 Apologetics, and with Roger Perkins, 
God willing, those debates, it's a two-parter. It's one debate, but in two parts. It's coming out this week, God willing. The phrase, Abi Ad. Mark Cyril, I hope you're listening. And the gentleman prophecy was asking, I hope you're listening. Because I want to answer this question for you guys. Check it out. Don't take my word for it. It's Abi Ad or Avi Ad. Literally, it means my father of eternity or father of eternity. Father what does eternity. it mean for the Messiah to be father? Do you know that Jesus can be your father without being God the father? Let me prove that to you. For those of you listening, is Adam our father? I just want them to hear. Man, someone's screaming outside. I hope everything's good. Is Adam our father? He's our yeah. father, right? Do you want to right. make sure? But he's not God the father. Now, is Abraham our father? Romans 4.16. Yes, he's our father, but he's not God the father. In other words, you can be a father without being God the father. So what does father of eternity mean? Father of eternity means, and don't take my word for it. Look at the lexical use for the word ab in the Hebrew. The word ab can mean father in the sense of one who's your progenitor, or father meaning possessor or source. The father of strength, the father of beauty, meaning the one who possesses strength and beauty. Father eternity literally means this child is the possessor of everlasting life, possessor of never ending life. So the Messiah is the father eternity in that he is the possessor of everlasting life. And he is the one who bestows on us everlasting life when he believe, when we believe in him. So in that sense, he's a father in that He's the one who sustains us and gives us never-ending life, which is exactly what the New Testament teaches. John 1, 4. In Jesus, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. That's one. John 5, 21. John 5, 21. Just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so too the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it to. So too the Son gives life to whom he chooses. John 10, 27 to 28. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and I give them what? Everlasting life. I give them everlasting life. They shall never perish. No one can pluck them out of my hand. That's John 10, 27, 28. John 11, 25 to 26. John 11, 25 to 26. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live, and he who believes and lives shall never die. Do you believe this? John 14, verse 6. John 14, verse 6. Jesus answered and said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Acts 3, 15. You killed the author, the creator, the ruler of life. But God raised them from the dead. Acts Amen. 3, 14 and 15, specifically verse 15. So you understand what it means? He is the father of eternity without being God the father. So in one sense, Jesus is our Father, as the Holy Spirit is our Father, as God the Father is our Father, because if by Father you mean the one who gives you life and sustains you, well, the Father created you and gives you life. The Son created you and gives you life. The Holy Spirit creates you and gives you life. All three together as the one God created all things and gives life to all things, and therefore all three of them are our Father in that sense, without the Son and Spirit being God the Father. And where's the proof that the Spirit also gives you life? John 6, 63. The Spirit gives life. The words I speak to you are, are Spirit and life. The flesh avails for nothing. John 6, 63. The Spirit gives life. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 6. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 6. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. I hope I answered the question thoroughly. Amen, brother. Amen. As always, what a privilege to have you here. Uh, Lord bless you, and uh, may he heal your voice real quickly. Do you have any live streams coming soon, tomorrow? Yeah, or I, may, I may do a surprise late night stream to, today. I may do a late night live stream. If I do, it will be around, let's see, uh, maybe 12 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. I may. If not, God willing, tomorrow, Lord willing, I will be doing a live stream around 4 p.m. Eastern standard time if the lord wills but guys do pray for my daughters and i my two angels i got two beautiful girls that god bless us keeps us healthy provides for us abundantly saves them from any damage brings them into my life and the lord keeps me holy and pure to be a doer of his word and also pray for the provision to do ministry and do go to my 
websites, read the articles. I have all this information in articles, not like David Wood who puts you to sleep. And when he invites you to do a live stream, he takes 90% of the conversation and only lets you speak 10% of the time. Go to the website, read the materials, use them, and come to my YouTube channel, Shamunian. Hit the subscribe button and watch the videos and learn and be blessed and be edified for the glory of Jesus. Amen, my brother. And we'll be in touch, you and I, to determine when would be the next time we're going to do this. And I hope everybody uh, can see the benefit of deep theological topics like this and no better than our dear brother Sam Shimon to handle all of that. And you can see why we love this brother. So brother, may the Lord bless you, um, you know, protect you and uh, just give you peace and joy that surpasses all understanding. And finally, brother, some people may not know, I'll be surprised of course, uh, to know what channel is yours. So if you would uh, describe to them your YouTube channel, the name is Shamonian, right? Yes, Shamonian, S-H-A-M-O-U-N-I-A-N. And folks, I want to encourage you to subscribe to his channel, become a Patreon patron, give towards his work because, you know, the brother is 100% basically a missionary. He lives by faith and we need to stand up and help each other here and, and no better than the brother, of course, uh, to uh, be worthy of your sacrifice. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you again, my brother, and we'll God be in touch you. soon. Christ is risen, risen right. indeed. Amen. God bless, guys. Take care.